Megan. Yeah, how are you? Good, how are you? Good. I'm just gonna mute for a minute. Oh, you're fine. Okay. Thank you. You can mute for a while. Okay, all right, thanks. Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. It's fun to see all of the familiar faces and new names rolling in. For those that don't know me, I'm Megan Raymond and I direct programs and membership here at WCET. So we're so glad that you joined us today. We have a wonderful webinar coming up to talk about our OER work and regional compacts. As we go through today, if you have any questions, go ahead and enter them into the question box. If you put them in the chat, we may overlook them. So please do try and put them in the question box. We'll hold those till the Q&A portion of the webinar. And if there's, for some reason, we can't get to all of the questions, we'll be sure to share those with the panelists and get responses back to you. Kim just put a link to the slides in the chat. So feel free to click on that and you can follow along. And it is being recorded and captions are available. We'll send the link out next week. We would like to thank our sponsor, Vitac, for making the cap captions available today. Again, if you have any questions, enter them into the question box and we'll get to those as we can. And I'd like to go ahead and pass it over to my wonderful colleague, Dr. Tanya Spillavoy, who directs our open policy work here at WCET. Welcome, Tanya. Hi, thank you, Megan, and thank you everybody who's here today. We see so many familiar names in the attendee list and we're just thrilled to have you part of our um, exciting new announcement today. And um, if you have questions, please feel free to ask us um, and we'll do the best we can to help you. So I'm Tanya and I work at WCET as the Director of Open Policy. Um, do I, oh, there we go. And I'd like to uh, introduce the wonderful panelists I have today. Um, we've been working together for more than a year. Uh, this is Liliana Diaz, the policy analyst at WICHI. Uh, Lindsay Gum, the fellow for open education at NEBI. Uh, Tiffany Harrison, the research associate at SREB. And Jenny Parks, the vice president of policy and research and I don't know what else at MEC. <laughs> So to introduce our collaboration, uh, these, this is a map and it shows uh, the regional compacts in the United States. You'll see that big red region in the west is the Wichi region and Wichi includes a lot of states and also associated territories. So um, all kinds of wonderful places that are way out in the ocean are part of Wichi and we're so excited to have um, so many diverse and interesting stakeholders part of the Wichi, um, the Wichi region. We also have, um, you can see this crosshatch section in the middle of the United States. There are two Dakotas, <laughs> North and South. <laughs> Some people get them kind of mixed up, like it's one big thing. But um, I live in North Dakota and we are part of both Mac and Wichi. So, uh, North Dakota and South Dakota are members of two regional compacts. And that's one of the ways that I got involved in the regional compacts because I used to work at the university system in North Dakota and had a lot of contact with both MEC and WICHI. Um, and you'll see the large, the largest um, compact region is SREB. And you can see the big blue section at the bottom of the map. 
Um, and we have the New England states and they're well represented today from Lindsay Gum. And there are two um, states that aren't part of any compact region in, in gray, but they do primarily associate with New England. And so uh, Nebby works a lot with these states and we're all, so together, um, all of the regional compacts encompass the entire United States and all of the associated territories, which is really exciting. So what are we doing exactly? Um, we came together to focus on open educational resources. And we felt like doing this together as a group um, would reduce duplication of effort rather than one state doing something and then everyone else does it again. We learn from each other, we share best practice. We're sharing um, initiatives and cost savings uh, research. We're talking about open pedagogy and there's a huge focus on equity. So one of the great things that you'll hear today is how each of the regions is taking a particular focus and really diving into that and then coming back to the group and sharing it. Um, so that's what our, our project is really about is this huge national consortium. So before we get into those presentations, we'd like to know where you're from. So now that you've seen the map and you know what the regional compacts are, please answer this question. Which higher ed regional compacts are you part of? We're just interested in who you are and where you're from today. There's a second question if you're starting that one. Um, what job category best fits your role? There might be quite a few others on this list since a lot of us are open education um, researchers and champions. So that might be kind of interesting. If you'd like to just introduce yourself in the chat, go ahead and do that. And we'd love to hear more about you. I see um, people are chiming in and it's really fun to see where you're all from. That's one of the cool things about WCET is that we have members all across the nation and everyone is welcome. So I think we're going to let you have about, we have 54 people who voted, and then we'll share results shortly. So you can go, um, here we go, I'll go ahead and share the results. We can see them. Okay, so you can see Nebby, Mac, Witchy region. 2% <laughs> of people said I have no idea, <laughs> which is fine. And then um, here are the representatives from the different job descriptions to talk about your role. Thank you for doing that. And I'll go ahead and uh, keep that open for a while if we can, so everyone can chime in. All right, next slide. Um, so recently I just published a big research um, study with Jeff Seaman at Bayview Analytics. And I was curious to know if all of these wonderful OER initiatives that we've all been um, involved with are actually having an effect on faculty. So uh, oftentimes we wonder, do these top-down initiatives really impact the people on the ground? And we know in OER that there's so much energy at the grassroots level. We, we cannot ignore all the exciting innovations that are happening in classrooms, in libraries, all of the, all of the really hands-on work from instructional designers and the people doing the technology to make it all happen, all of that really um, energizes the field. But there also has to be some kind of organizational structure. Um, and we've seen a lot more lately uh, in states and regions where perhaps there's a grant project, the legislature funds something, some kind of policy comes in uh, at the federal level saying everything has to be open if you receive like a federal grant. Those, those top-down initiatives really help support the people who are on the field and doing all of this work. So the, um, the study that I did with Bayview, we really wanted to see what impact large-scale OER initiatives were having on actual faculty choices. And we found that the impact of OER awareness on initiatives on adoptions is consistent and it doesn't matter 
where the faculty member is. It could be at a two or four year institution and it didn't matter the level of the course being taught in all regions of the United States. It was consistent across that if faculty who are aware of one or more initiatives about OER, they were three to four times more likely to be adopters of OER. So that's very exciting. So we know that all of these really um, organized, top down, um, the energy and the, and the funding that goes into some of the large scale initiatives is really helping and making a difference and supporting the people who are doing the work um, in their classrooms. So when implemented at the institution level, OER initiatives result in a measurable rise in the number of faculty who are aware of OER. So how can we duplicate that effort, learn from each other, share best practice? I think there's still a lot to be learned about the best ways to approach it um, and what really helps the most, what really supports people and advances the field. So that's probably the next step in this research. Uh, so today we'd like to talk about um, what the individual compacts are doing. So now you kind of know the whole story first and I'll turn it over to Jenny. Thank you, Tanya. Um, as Tanya said, I'm Jenny Parks. I'm the Vice President for Policy and Research at MEC, the Midwestern Higher Education Compact. Um, and as you can see, there's some good information there on the slide about how you can reach out to me and also learn about the work we've been doing with OER for the last few years at MEC. So next slide, please. So um, our, the theme of our work for the last two years and then for the next 18 months moving forward is still going to be um, building capacity and community for OER implementation. Um, the open education um, community has long been one that's been very grassroots and been very much about connections and sharing ideas and opportunities with each other. And so we really are emphasizing that quite a bit in our work at MAC. Next slide, please. Um, it goes back to 2018. Um, we started, we've, we've had um, support from the Hewlett Foundation for a couple of years now. First, we had a great big regional convening in 2018 where we brought um, folks from all 12 MAC states so that they could begin to learn about OER and for the ones who were already doing it, they could share what they had already accomplished. And out of that convening of about 75 people, um, emerged 12 state OER action teams that have met on a regular basis since then. And they make six month plans, they set goals, and they move the needle on OER in each of their states. Um, we've also during this time conducted a lot of webinars to keep to showcase the work in our states, but also to bring new ideas to our stakeholders. And then finally, we did receive an additional Hewlett grant at the end of 2019, where we tried something new we moved from um, working mainly with librarians and faculty and instructional designers to doing some leadership training for institutional and system leaders because we, we realized from our interactions with the stakeholders in each of our state teams that um, a lot of really impactful work can happen once the leadership of a system or an institution knows more about OER and knows some of the specific ways to incentivize it and support it. Please, no, next slide. So um, one of the big, um, here are some of the accomplishments for the last two years that we've had with our work. Um, our teams have been able to make presentations to legislatures in a number of our states. And now we have some mandates in some of the states for regular reporting um, on OER. Um, some of our states have been able to do statewide surveys to kind of understand the baseline of where their institutions are with OER implementation. Um, we've had a number of them create repositories, combine repositories, align them better so that they're um, more efficient and they're used from, in a, from K-12 to post-secondary education. And then we've had a number of states decide that they really valued the work of what had been the Open Textbook Network is now the Open Education Network and decide to join that organization. Um, so again, they're accessing the larger community. It's one of our big um, goals is to make sure that uh, folks aren't working in isolation, that they're not only connected to others in their state and in the region, but indeed as a nation and in the world. And then finally, we've had some of our states, um, their OER, our little OER action team um, actually have become official statewide OER committees. So next slide, please. For example, um, there is now um, at, with the Kansas Board of Regents, an OER steering committee 
that is a standing committee for that um, entity. And there are members, um, there are representatives from every public institution in the state who sit on that board and on that committee. They've been meeting for more than a year and they are doing amazing work in coordinating OER work across the state and in driving it forward. Next. In the case of Michigan, folks came together for their, to create their own Michigan OER network. So it's as large as the one in Kansas, but it is, um, folks own it themselves. Their, their OER network has created its own entity there. So we've got some big things happening there. We really aspire for this type of thing to happen in all 12 states. Next. So over the next 18 months, this is what we hope to do. Um, first of all, we do have some new support from the Hewlett Foundation and also some, um, we've had big investments from the MAC Commission over the last few years that help and match those Hewlett funds. We'll continue to work with our state OER action teams. Some of the specific things we'll do at MEC is engage in some procurement exploration activities. MEC is known as the cost savings compact because we do a lot of contracting where we bring large pools of buyers to the table for um, vendors to contemplate lower the price, increase the, um, and improve the terms of service. So we wanna to try to see if there's some room in the technology space that surrounds OER to do that. Um, we're also going to be engaging as each of the compacts will in a research project. Not surprisingly, the one we've chosen at MAC is on how you track and therefore calculate cost savings and return on investment with OER. We'll also be facilitating um, state OER summits. We've got one coming up on in Open Education Week in Missouri. So if you do see that one and attend that one, you'll see that the platform and all the logistics will come through MEC. We're very excited to help them so they can focus on content and we focus on logistics. Um, we'll also be scaling and doing those leadership trainings that I talked about with the Open Education Network. We're going to have several states where that's going to be what they don't necessarily want need um, a virtual summit. So they've chosen a leadership training at the state level. One of the things that came out of that regional uh, senior leaders training in uh, December of 2019 was everyone was saying, oh, it's really great to talk to the folks at the other uh, states, but we need this as a state. We need other folks who work in our same systems to get the same training for us to work with each other. Um, so several of our states are gonna go that route. Um, we're also going to convene some special groups and do some um, concentrated work on developing and providing more, um, more clarity and more structure in the area of OER for CTE, career and technical ed. It has its own special set of challenges. And so that's a place where we're really excited to um, try to lend some organization and clarity. And then finally, we're gonna be helping um, SREB. Their research project is about OER in dual enrollment situations. MEC has a long history of working with dual enrollment. And so we're able to bring a number of stakeholders and connections to that research and collaborate with them. Next, please. That was it. Thank you very much. I'm gonna turn it over to Lindsay Gum. She is the count, my counterpart for this type of work up in NEBI, the New England Board of Higher Education. Thanks, Jenny. And it's always really exciting to hear um, what MEC is doing. They have definitely been a trailblazer and a huge inspiration for us up in Nebi. Um, so thank you for sharing all of that wonderful work. Um, my name is Lindsay Gum. I am the Fellow for Open Education at the New England Board of Higher Ed. Um, and I've been working with Nebi for a little over a year now. Um, I am actually an open education practitioner myself. I um, am, a am a librarian at a university in Rhode Island. Um, but next slide, please. What I've been doing with Nebi is helping them strategize how to um, scale open education in the Northeast. Um, so that not only includes the six New England states, but also New York and New Jersey. So about a year ago, we uh, convened a regional advisory committee with representation from, again, the six New England states plus New York and New Jersey. Um, it's comprised of not only OER practitioners, but also senior leadership at institutions. Um, we also have a representative from the Massachusetts library system. So we have a really interesting um, group of minds that we've brought together and they did a fabulous job helping us identify three major priorities that we've been focusing on for the last year. 
So you can see here, the three priorities are policy development, leadership awareness and engagement, and practitioner support. And these are the three areas that these brilliant folks said, listen, like we've been doing this work for years and these are the areas that we really would love Nebi to help support us in. So for policy development, we, um, we've been looking at how do we, how do we help um, leaders at the state level, institution level and system level, how do we help them develop sound policies around open education? Um, so we actually, about a month ago, I just put it in the chat, we published a, policy, a regional policy report on what's been going on in New England, New York, and New Jersey, um, just to give folks who might be looking to create policies at their institution or even on the state level an idea of what's going on, what's worked, um, lessons learned, so that they can better inform their own policies. This concept of leader awareness, leadership awareness and engagement is a huge one. Um, our advisory committee said there's a, a significant gap between the practitioners on the ground doing this work and the key leadership at the top. And as a practitioner myself, yes, that is absolutely true. So we are working really hard to bridge that gap. Um, and one of the major ways we've been focusing on bridging that gap particularly now with COVID. Um, we initially wanted to have a big leadership summit, but that obviously got derailed in the spring. But what we've been able to do is leverage our um, journal. So we published the New England Journal of Higher Education, which is read by key leadership in our area. Um, so we've published a series that we've called Practitioner Perspectives. So We've reached out to a bunch of practitioners in our area and they've written pieces on various um, various areas in, in open education and we publish them. Um, and we've gotten really great feedback and it's a way for key leadership to say, okay, Nebi is you know, publishing this article and now I can see what practitioners on the ground are doing. I can look at some you know, concrete examples of what this open education is um, and why it might be important for me, say, as a provost to support at my institution. So it's been really successful and we're gonna keep moving that forward. This final area of practitioner support um, is a significant one. Often, you know, we've heard that, I know this is not um, uh, unique to New England, it happens in all of our regions, there's often one person doing this work um, on a campus or in a system, um, and it can be very isolating. So we really are you know, going to be focusing on supporting our practitioners moving forward. Um, can you go to the next slide, please? Thanks. Um, so one thing, again, that we have done is this practitioner perspectives, um, and it's really given this, this is the series I was just talking about in our journal, and it's not, its purpose is not only to connect um, our key leadership with initiatives that are going on, but it's also to help those individuals who might be the only one at their campus doing this work. And if they can see concrete examples of what other institutions and practitioners are doing, it's really helpful. So I know I share a lot of this content on Twitter um, where I'm you know, tied into my practitioners in my area. Um, and I just put the link to this um, open ed lightning talk that we did. It's 10 minutes um, and we just kind of highlight some of the um, articles that have been in the series. Um, so we encourage you to check that out. And actually all of the open ed conference presentations have been recorded and archived and can be found on YouTube. Next slide, please. So to kind of tie back to that practitioner support, um, we're really going to be focusing on this moving forward in the next 18 months. As Jenny mentioned, we did uh, receive funding from the, the Hewlett Foundation and the area that Nebi has decided to focus on um, is how can we use OER to inform better teaching and learning practices. Um, so we're going, going to be looking at um, this idea of extending pedagogical flexibility. So how do the actual licensing structures of OER allow for innovative pedagogy in the classroom? And then how 
does that impact student success? So students who are invited to be invited to participate um, in coursework that involves open pedagogy, how does that impact their learning and ultimately their success? Um, and then we will continue to engage our key leadership. So we do um, plan on holding, fingers crossed, an in-person event um, in the spring of 2022 to um, better inform and educate our senior leadership in our area. Um, but if I can just go back to the, the first one quickly, um, this idea of extending pedagogical flexibility. So how can we use the licensing structures of these, these resources to involve our students in the creation of their own learning materials? So how can we help educators understand the licensing structures and then they can take that knowledge into the classroom and say okay as a group we, we are going to revise this textbook or we are going to create our own materials that better reflect you as students so we're adding cultural relevancy um, we're diversifying the curriculum and we're increasing the student engagement so it's not just you know rote memorization they're actually participating in the creation of this content and we have some exciting news. We are actually, um, to conduct this work, we're doing a, a regional community of practice. So we um, are currently accepting applications. Um, so we, we hope to have one faculty representative from each of the eight states to come together as a community of practice to learn more about um, how to leverage the licensing structures of OER to implement open pedagogy into the classroom. And I think that's it for me. So I'm gonna hand this off to my fabulous colleague, Tiffany Harrison down at SREV. Hi everyone, my name is Tiffany Harrison and I'm a research associate at the Southern Regional Education Board, which is based in Atlanta. Uh, I work with the EdTech and Multi-State Cooperative uh, Programs Department, which obviously is a mouthful, uh, but we have been doing a lot of work with uh, open education uh, resources. Uh, so when you think about SREB, one thing I want you to know is that SREB is the oldest and largest of the four education compacts. We were uh, created in 1948. Uh, and when you think about the South, you typically think of high heat, good food, even higher humidity. Uh, but if you think about the map that Tanya uh, talked about at the beginning of the presentation, uh, the Southeastern states have eight of the top 10 uh, highest poverty states in the, in the US. So SREB covers 16 states. So half of our states uh, are the highest poverty states in, in the US. Uh, we have 95% of all of the historically black colleges and universities uh, housed within our region. And we are the only compact that uh, focuses on both post-secondary education and K-12 education. And so as such, uh, we were able to decide that when it came to being funded through the Hewlett Foundation that we also wanted to um, have that bridge between post-secondary and K-12 education. And so our focus for our grant is dual enrollment. And depending on what state you come from, it could be called dual credit, early college, concurrent enrollment, um, because it, it differs from every state. But our, our focus is OER and uh, dual enrollment. Some of the past work that we have done uh, with OER in our region, it's a little bit of, of everything. We've done presentations for our Legislative Advisory Council. Uh, we've done uh, presentations for our Legislative and Governor's Staff meeting, our Education Technology uh, Cooperative Annual meetings, and also our board meetings. And so, like I mentioned, we have uh, 16 states in our region and there are four board members from every state, which makes up um, a governor and four legislators. Uh, we have a school improvement division at SREB and they are uh, working with the advanced career pathways and, and working on some OER courses this year. Uh, we've also been working with HBCUs and minority uh, serving institutions on equity and access issues, uh, which include OER. Uh, and we also have a dual enrollment initiative that has an advisory panel that make up stakeholders across our region 
Um, and uh, one of the links that are provided in the, in the slide can give you some more information about that. But our dual enrollment initiative really is to, the goals are to make colleges more affordable for students from a wide variety of socioeconomic backgrounds, uh, to provide a quality education experience for all students, and to help states meet their education attainment and workforce goals. Uh, we also provide some college affordability profiles and you can see the link in the slide. Um, and so those are really done, I think every other year. And we're hoping uh, to add OER and spotlight OER in the next iteration of the affordability profiles. Also, we have our 10 issues in education technology. And so we've had um, numerous presentations, um, both in person and obviously this year because of COVID virtually, um, such as folks from uh, Creative Commons, from Spark with uh, Merlot and also from CCC OER. Um, we recently, in, at the end of November, had our EdTech Cooperative Annual Meeting um, to discuss our next round of top 10 issues in education technology. And I'm very pleased to say that OER made it into uh, our, our next iteration of top 10 issues. And so we're really excited to, to move forward with that. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? Thanks. So, SREB is gonna focus its efforts for this grant, like I mentioned before, on dual enrollment programs. And uh, as students move from high school into post-secondary education with an emphasis on equitable access, success, and affordability. So our dual enrollment research focus uh, is really on three main areas, the state and district legislation and policies, the current OER activities and dual enrollment courses in our region, and uh, the impact of college readiness standards on equitable participation in dual enrollment. So our research is gonna include an analysis of relevant laws, cost distribution and cost savings uh, for dual enrollment courses, uh, a survey instrument to identify uh, all of the OER, or hopefully all of the OER uh, and open, open resources in dual uh, enrollment courses, and a analysis of impact and, and college readiness standards on equitable access when it comes to dual enrollment. So our, like I mentioned before, SREB has a, a dual enrollment advisory panel and they have really been able to help us inform the work for this grant, which is incredibly exciting. And so as we you know, work our ways into the issues of equity, we found that you know, there are a lot of high school students, uh, particularly in our region, obviously, that would benefit from dual enrollment, um, but are not able to do so for whatever reason, because they're not meeting the minimum college readiness standards. And so that's one of the other things that we're uh, really hoping to, to dive into. Um, our work with HBCUs and MSIs will also help inform us on policies. And um, hopefully the and policies and practices for um, improving equitable access uh, and and reaching out to and, and making sure that you know our minority students are are being successful not only um, in school but once they uh, move into the workforce. Um, next slide, thank you. So over the course of the next eighteen months, with this grant, we you know are we're planning on doing a lot of activities and we're going to you know, hit the ground running and, and make sure that we can get all of these done. And so a lot of our strengths at SREB really include research uh, data, publications and convenings of stakeholders across our region. And so we believe that working together with all of our states, you know, we can achieve more collaborative, collaboratively than our states could achieve on their own. So one of the things we wanna do is really raise awareness of OER and dual enrollment by coordinating with each of the SREB states and really creating a contact list of both OER and dual enrollment leaders uh, at K-12 um, state agencies, community college systems, uh, post-secondary um, university level education agencies, and really to improve on the, the networking at a, at a region-wide uh, level. We also intend to research some legislation and policies that will 
um, identify what is happening and, and what can be improved or has the potential to improve when it comes to sustainability of OER efforts. Um, we'll be developing and disseminating a survey to identify current OER and dual enrollment activities within SREB states. Uh, it also, we'll be researching developmental education and college readiness standards. Again, like I mentioned, um, we have, with the work with our dual enrollment um, advisory panel, we realized that there are a lot of students who could really benefit from dual enrollment, you know, going from K-12 into the post-secondary world, but you may or may not be able to um, access, access those things. Um, we also want to inform regional governors, legislators, SHEOs of our OER research and progress and policy recommendations. Um, hopefully, fingers crossed, you know, at some point we'll be able to host a regional convening of uh, OER and dual enrollment uh, leaders to also help network and, and increase uh, awareness and share um, policies and best practices regarding OER and dual enrollment and um, develop publications. We'll be conducting webinar series for policymakers, educators, and practitioners. Uh, we have done some webinars in the past and we are working toward um, setting up some new webinars uh, in the next uh, few months throughout the spring that we're really excited about. And also initiate conversations, which we've really already started to do and networking with uh, HBCUs and, and feeder schools. And you know, lastly, we really, uh, I, and I can't say this enough, is, is to really collaborate with the other regional compacts um, in activities. And, and uh, Jenny from MEC mentioned that, you know, they'll be working with us and we'll be working with them on um, some OER and dual enrollment work. So we're really excited about this opportunity uh, with the, the Hewlett Foundation and we're looking forward to um, you know, hit the ground running with our, our OER work in the South. So thank you. That's awesome. Now you can see why each of these regions with their amazing focus, their in-depth knowledge of their states and all of these awesome stakeholders um, that together really can share best practice and we all learn so much from each other all the time. Um, next is Liliana and she's from uh, the Wichi region and she's the policy analyst who's in charge of open educational resources there. Welcome Lily. Hi, um, it's great to see uh, some familiar uh, faces or names in the attendee list so it's great to see you all again and to those that are new and I haven't met I look forward to meeting you. Um, my name is Eliana Diaz. I'm a policy analyst at the Western Interstate Commission for Higher Education. We cover the western half of the United States, so 14 states, including uh, the Commonwealth of the Mariana Islands and Guam. And I feel very fortunate to be working with the other regional compacts because uh, unlike some of our, our, our friends here who have been doing this work for a while now, Wichi is uh, launching these efforts. So can we go to the next slide? So I would like to share a little bit about what we're hoping to accomplish and here in the next coming months as we start developing some OER initiatives here in the Wichi, in Wichi and supporting the states that have already been doing this work. So Wichi's OER efforts focus on four major goals with an understanding that some of our states have been doing this work for a long time and are light years into adopting, scaling, developing OER in their states. And there's other states and, and areas that are just starting their OER efforts. So our four major areas include um, developing a regional network among states and territories in the West. Um, and this includes supporting states with advancing their OER efforts by developing webinars that can support or address some of the challenges that they're currently facing or to educate you know, faculty on OER and broaden that understanding of what OER is and how it can support student success. We also are conducting virtual regional convenings. And when it is safe to do so, face-to-face -face convenings, because that networking piece is very critical in advancing OER. So we're hoping we can do that once uh, our reality of COVID is no longer you know, a threat. Also distribution of newsletters to keep consistent and continuous communication as to what is happening in our region and among states and institutions and systems. 
And most importantly, uh, we're launching the network at the end of this month of folks working in the Western region um, to really bring together and have conversations about tackling pressing challenges that we all face and how we can collectively identify those and really tackle those challenges together. As Tiffany mentioned, you know, we really uh, wanna bring folks together to be able to work collectively uh, on OER issues to really not reinvent the wheel, recreate the wheel, but to really be able to move some of this work forward, maybe a lot faster um, and collectively. So kind of the next thing that, you know, what she is hoping that we can do is definitely conduct needs analysis of policy and practice to identify any gaps um, to support state policy and OER. So we wanna aggregate those state policies and statutes from each of our states and territories in the Wichi region to identify, you know, what are the opportunities here that we can leverage to really further along and support OER adoption and scaling within uh, states in the West. Um, the goal is to really bring at the forefront those gaps and address them regionally so we don't have to recreate the wheel among the different states and territories in the West. Um, thirdly, uh, we want to engage in research on the impacts of OER, specifically in closing equity and post-secondary gaps, skills gaps as well, and all while paying specific attention to how OER is assessed and are created uh, by under-resourced institutions, Hispanic-serving institutions, minority-serving institutions. The West has a, a large number of um, Hispanic-serving institutions and anapeses and tribal colleges and universities. So how can we support these institutions? with their OER efforts. Um, we also want to make sure that, you know, we identify promising practices and policies that scale OER by paying particular attention to the practices that center equity and increase student success. Um, and we wanna make sure that we are focusing and developing any uh, an equity assessment tool that can be utilized in the higher education policy space and in conversations of OER, when it comes to conversations of OER. And finally, we want to broaden recognition that equity is essential to open educational resources. The goal is to embed equity in the policies and practices that lead to scaling and adoption of OER among uh, the region and understanding that it's important to have states lead their OER and equity efforts as um, to best suit their needs as each state and territory is different and has different needs. So we want to make sure that we're uh, um, aware and recognize those different needs. So if you are in the Western half of the United States or part of Guam or the Marianne Islands, please reach out and I'd love to uh, share more as we are launching this network at the end of the month. So, yeah. So I give it back to Tanya, our moderator. unmuted myself. <laughs> I was searching for um, an answer to one of the questions and I really appreciate all the people who are jumping in to help answer questions. Um, we can go to a few of these now and there are so many smart and capable and lovely helpers on the participant list. Um, so let's look in here and look at some of the questions that have been asked. Um, we have a question from Sherry and she wanted to know if we could get people's email addresses. So anyone who's willing to kind of work together and share, please put your email addresses into the chat, um, connect with each other and certainly connect with the speakers who are here today. Um, also, we had a question about OER resources for the workforce. And I think you heard um, uh, Tiffany's presentation a little bit talking about career and technical education. And certainly that field is in development and one that really is necessary and needed. Uh, Besta was kind enough to offer the link for Skills Commons, but there are so many other places that you can find career and technical education um, initiatives and, and um, resources. Uh, we also had, if you can see um, into the questions, there's an exciting new pilot in North Carolina and um, J. Edward Ladenberger, one of the participants, shared about it. So please check that out, Open North Carolina Communi Community Colleges. Um, and then we also had a question 
about um, OER for equity. Um, and I wanted to share an article from a really great study from um, Georgia. And if anyone has the link for that, but it was the widespread Georgia study. Um, uh, I'm trying to remember who the, <laughs> who the authors were, but we, we, it shows that students who were Pell eligible were especially affected and did especially better in OER courses. And that's mainly because they were low income and Pell eligible students. And so it really showed, yes, it's the Watson study. Thanks, Jonathan. <laughs> um, yeah, and so if anybody has the link to that, that would really, really help um, talk about equity, how it really um, even the playing field for all kinds of students. Um, there are, uh, let's see, cost savings. So there's a cost savings question. It says that it's well understood. However, the co-creation of OER among students and faculty that includes case studies and examples that reflect the student context is something I hope will gain traction in the OER work that is being undertaken. I think that's a great suggestion. There's still so much to study in the field. Um, and I also, <laughs> I also um, would say that we're not totally sure about cost savings yet. Um, there's a lot of different ways to measure cost and um, we're, that's one of the things that MEC is working on. So if you have great ideas and some ways that really work, um, maybe contact Jenny. Um, are there Thank you for the people who have shared the Colvard and Watson study. That's the one I was thinking of. So that's awesome. It's a great equity study that really shows help for students. Um, any other questions that we have in the link that we see? We have. Okay. Okay. This is really exciting. There's a question um, a participant from Europe, Andreas Rambo. Um, are you considering giving your activities an international scope? Um, I would say that particularly in this group with National Consortium for OER, we're really focused on the United States and the associated territories and working within um, this region. However, we're very connected with OE Global and I would highly recommend uh, contacting um, Paul Stacy and the folks at OE Global and that would be fantastic for you to get connected there. Um, and what we want to do is really bring that global lens to help inform our work so that we're doing things that benefit the field, not just for our states and for the United States, but for everybody. And there's so much work to be done in terms of language proficiency, um, translation of texts into different language varieties, making things culturally relevant for different um, groups and for regions and for uh, societies. So we understand there's a lot globally happening, um, but there's so much work that has to be done just in our states and regions that we feel like we can't do everything. The cool thing about this initiative is we're open to collaborating with everybody. So um, really excited to be part of places like uh, OE Global and um, Creative Commons Global. Spark has a wonderful um, global initiative as well. So we're just open to all kinds of sharing. Um, let's see if we have other questions. Oh, well, of course you can contact Una Daily because CCC OER is port, part of OE Global. And that's a great answer in the chat. You can always contact her. She's happy to help. Um, anybody else have questions or anything left to add? I think we could probably talk about it all day. <laughs> it would never end. But if you would like to just connect and afterwards you find some questions you have, especially for our special panelists who have unique and interesting perspectives from their regions, if you want to get more involved, if you'd like to be part of this big initiative, Everybody is welcome. Anyone is welcome to contact and we will find work for you to do because it is there's a lot to be done. <laughs> so uh, you can stay connected by visiting uh, wcet.witchy.edu and you can learn about um, more about WCT and I'll go over to Megan. Thanks everybody.
Thank you so much, Tanya. And this has been such a fun webcast just to see the, the sharing and the collaboration. So OER crowd is a fantastic crowd. So I just wanted to take a few minutes to do some final housekeeping and thank Tanya for pulling this all together and wishing good luck to all of the compacts as they get started on this work. So we did record this webinar and we will send the link out. So be sure to share that with your networks. And I just want to take a quick moment to thank those that support the work here that we do at WCET, including our supporting partners and our annual sponsors. So again, if you'd like to know more about WCET or any of our initiatives, do visit the website or reach out. But we'll see you on the next WCET event. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate your time. Take care.